Will Kerbal Space Program 2 live up to the years of hype and anticipation? Well, I recently got hands-on experience with the game, so it was an excellent opportunity to attempt to find out. Here then are a few of my thoughts and impressions on my gameplay session. The session itself was around two and a half hours long, so as we go through this video, do keep that in mind. It's a reasonable amount of time for a quick look, but nowhere near enough time to go into depth on every aspect of the game. That said, it's more than enough to get some initial impressions. So the KSP-2 preview event itself took place at the European Space Agency in the Netherlands. Private Division arranged for both accommodation and travel and invited a large amount of individuals along. That included space enthusiasts, gamers as well as journalists. The footage you're looking at on screen right now was captured for my play session. So, how did it all stack up? Well, my first impression is that it's obvious KSP-2 is not just a modded KSP-1. The game has very clearly been built from the ground up. I mean, we all knew that, the developers have told us that enough. However, seeing it in action made the truth of that very, very clear. From the new and improved UIs to the vastly improved graphics, from the ways in which we interact with the game to the feedback that KSP-2 provides, everything has clearly been looked at and considered, and that attention to improvements really does shine through. Now, some of these improvements are more subtle than others, such as the interaction with the maneuver planning UI elements, whilst other improvements are far more blatant. One of the larger improvements, at least that I felt to be so, can be found in the vehicle assembly building where players go to assembled rockets. The flow to vehicle construction here has been vastly improved, and in some cases due to what are relatively minor changes. For example, here you can see the parts list. Parts are now colour-coded by size, making it extremely easy to quickly select components that fit together. Parts are also categorised by subtype. For example, fuel tanks are categorised by fuel type. Now, out on the launch pad is perhaps the first place the improved visuals really hit home. The launch pad has been dramatically improved, and you can see the results of that right here pretty clearly. One thing I did notice here, and really would do want to point out, is that the Space Center no longer has just a single launch pad. As we lift off here, you can notice the existence of other launch pads. Very obviously, this is a precursor for multiplayer and I'll talk a little bit about multiplayer further into the video. Remaining on the subject of visuals for a moment longer though, these have been enhanced throughout the entire game. Moving to higher altitudes, and you can see just how nice Kerbal itself looks. Take a moment to notice these clouds as well. Now, it's likely that some veterans of KSP may be thinking that the original can, when modded, look better than this. But there's a very important word there, and that is modded. What we are seeing here is vanilla KSP-2. It's also in the very early stages, the very initial stages of early access, so there's plenty of room for this to all be improved further. So the subject of early access, this leads us quite nicely into the topic of performance and content. Starting with content, KSP-2's first phase will include just the Kerbal star system, I did take a brief tour of this uh, entire area actually, and as I'm talking to you, you can see a few of Kerbal's infamous worlds on the screen. Now, I will be taking a more detailed look at many of these worlds in an upcoming video, but what I want to talk about here are the broad strokes of the Kerbal star system itself. We start then with the Kerbal itself, as an example here. In some cases, the visual improvements are very apparent. Just look at the quality of the terrain. It all looks very, very nice. However, this isn't necessarily true for the entire planet. In some areas, there's still a lot of room for improvement. For example, some of the coastal areas of Kerbal appear to be fairly low resolution. Also, at this altitude, the clouds leave a lot to be desired. But to be perfectly fair here, the clouds themselves do look really, really nice when up close and when flying through them. Now, on the subject of clouds, I did have a short chat with one of the developers. I asked whether there was eventually going to be multiple cloud layers. For those of you who have tried any modern flight sims such as Microsoft Flight Simulator or DCS World, you will certainly be well aware of just how impressive multiple cloud layers can be. I was told that improvements to clouds are definitely a desired feature, but that, as with everything like this, 
such improvements come with the performance cost. In short, it's something that may happen, but I wasn't able to get a commitment. So generally speaking, as you're moving around the new Kerbal Star System, you'll notice that many of the planets are indeed vastly improved, both the planets and the moons themselves. And this holds true whether you're at a distance or whether you're heading down towards the surface. Some very, very nice visuals here. Now, moving on, the immersive improvements to planets aren't just visual, they're also audio. Many of the worlds within KSP2 have their own unique soundtrack now. I was pleasantly surprised to hear an amazing piece of music kick in as I was descending down to the surface of Vive. Have a short listen to this. So I will play the, that track for a bit longer in my upcoming video on planets, but I think many of you will agree that it does indeed sound very good. Whilst unfortunately I didn't get the chance to check out many of the other worlds from the surface, I have been told that most, if not all of them, have their own individual soundtracks. Ultimately then, the important takeaway point here is that as best as I could tell from my limited time here, the Kerbal the Star System feels pretty complete already. So whilst at this stage of early access there's still plenty of content to come further down the line, the Kabola system itself is certainly already in very good shape. Another area I really would have liked to have looked at is a closer look at the Space Center, as well as a closer look at the parts list for the vehicles. Unfortunately, time constraints kind of put a stop to that, so instead we'll move on to another subject, which is the subject of performance. Whilst I'm talking here, I will show you the graphic settings on screen, so you can see the options that are currently available in the build that I had access to. So the topic of performance itself has certainly been a bit of a big deal over the past few days. At the end of last week, Private Division revealed the early access system requirements for KSP2, and many people have found them, well, a little surprising, shall we say. As you can see, we are looking at an i5-6400, and an RTX 2060 for minimum specs. What does minimum specs mean precisely? Well, Private Division did confirm and have clarified that minimum specs should be able to run KSP2 at a resolution of 1080p on low settings, but I don't believe they touched on uh, what frame rates we could expect to see there. Meanwhile, the recommended specs are far more, well, far more beefy, an i5-11500, or Ryzen 5 3600, plus, listen to this, an RTX 3080. This indeed is a very, very beefy PC build, all things considered. According to Private Division, this will allow players to run KSP2 at a resolution of 1440p at high settings. And again, as best as I can tell at least, they didn't give any details on what frame rates can be expected here. So for now, it's currently impossible to say how KSP2 is going to run in the real world, and there's certainly been an understandable outcry about the system requirements. However, it's also important to understand that this is the first phase of early access. Private Division have pointed out that optimizations will be happening further down the line. So whilst, yes, early access looks as though it's going to be very demanding on the hardware, at least in the early stages, it shouldn't be assumed that this also means that the entire game will forever require this level of hardware. For now then, rightly or wrongly, players should probably not expect the game to run buttery smooth on anything but the more powerful hardware. But all that said, how did the game run during the preview event? Well, my experience was that things ran very well, but we need to keep a couple of things in mind here. Firstly, it looked as though everyone at the event was running the game on the same hardware, and as far as I understand it at least, these are the system specs for that PC. A Ryzen 9 7900X, an RTX 4080 with 32GB of RAM. This was at a resolution of 1440p and I do believe with all the settings set to high. Now the game itself did run very well for me and I didn't have any issues. I also had no problems with frame rates, although that said, occasionally, and usually in orbit, 
I did experience some microstutters and the hitching. These didn't go on for very long, and though it certainly wouldn't detract from the game, it was still noticeable on the occasions on the few occasions that it happened. Another point I think it's worth making here is that I didn't see anything obvious that would make the game have such high hardware requirements. In short then, the game did run very well. However, the important thing to consider here is that I wasn't building huge ships built from hundreds of components. Yes, the game looked good and ran very well in a controlled environment, but we won't know for sure how it would run in the real world until the 24th of February. And really, we need to wait and see what happens when players start building these really huge and complex ships. Okay, so moving on to another subject and briefly touching on tutorials. Tutorials were an area which, when flying into ESA, I had every intent of trying the tutorials out in full. From what we have been told over the past few years by the developers, these tutorials rightfully are going to be a big deal and they really need to help bring in a brand new audience. Ultimately though, I didn't get the opportunity to test these out. However, I did hear a few very good third-hand reports. Not everyone invited to the event were KSP players or had experience with the game. Yet even still, after watching the tutorials inbuilt into the game, people were able to successfully build and launch a ship into orbit. And that in itself sounds very promising, doesn't it? So there we have a bit of an overview of my time with the KSP2, and now I want to touch on a few of my final thoughts and give you a bit of a summary of everything that I kind of experienced. So from what I've seen, KSP2 is off to a very good start. The developers have very clearly spent a lot of time planning and thinking about how to improve the flow of the game. For the parts that I was able to experience, these improvements are all for the better. Now there are a few things that I was unable to find, such as the maneuver planning window from KSP1, the one where you uh, can fine tune your maneuver. It may be present within KSP2, but it wasn't obvious to me where it was. Likewise, there were some changes which players may find devices. For example, the navigation controls of the ship now feel far more responsive. It's an improvement that I really liked and I liked it a lot. But I suspect that not everyone is going to feel suited to this and may instead prefer, uh, prefer the navigation controls from KSP1. So that's not to say that the keys or anything like that are different. Everything there is the same. But just that the responsive responsiveness and the feedback felt somewhat changed and somewhat improved. I've already discussed performance. Uh, I think things are still out on just how well that's going to work. From what I was able to test, things did look good. But again, I think we're going to need to wait and see real-world experience before we get a true feel for that. The graphics, meanwhile, are very nice indeed. Although in the build I played, there were some missing effects, such as the re-entry graphics and water physics interactions. It's obvious that these will definitely come at a later date. Overall, the graphics have vastly improved, and I really did like what I saw that was on offer. And these include the launch effects, the engine effects, the graphics of the planets themselves, and generally the entire build for the game. It was really very cohesive and was overall a really nice experience. Another subject that, well, pretty much everyone was very interested in was multiplayer. And this subject came up a few times, although it turned out to be very difficult to draw anything out of the developers on this. They did confirm again that it will be coming at a much later date down the line. They also suggested that the scale of multiplayer will be larger than just a handful of friends planned together. The subject of players being able to co-op together via controlling different space agencies did come up, and this seemed to be pretty interesting. Apparently players will be able to collectively work together and think here of ESA and NASA working together on joint projects. It was also reiterated again that players will be able to compete on this front, although no details on precisely how that would work were given. On the subject of early access, so this is something which is certainly going to be somewhat subjective and everyone is going to feel a bit different about this. Personally, I felt that the current build has more than enough content in it to justify it going into early access release right now. For example, there's plenty to be getting on with, learning and experimenting with. However, I will reiterate the point that I have made before. I feel that $50 is a very high price for an early access title. Whilst everyone will certainly have a different opinion on that, but generally prices can be a subjective topic, I nonetheless feel that it is a little steep. 
And keep in mind that at this point there's still a lot of content missing. No science, no modding, at least not yet, and things like colonies and interstellar travel are coming later. So it's important to be aware that this game doesn't include everything. In fact, arguably, a KSP2's initial build will have less content than KSP1. However, that's not necessarily a bad thing. This is early access after all. So if you don't want to join in on that yet, it's completely fine. And if you would instead prefer to wait for more content, then you should definitely do that. However, if you can't wait or would prefer to be in on the game very early, then the current version is certainly looking good. What's more, if the developers are able to deliver on their promises, then this game will definitely have a very long tail. There'll be a lot of whole, well, a whole lot of updates coming after your initial purchase. Ultimately then, I had a good time with KSP2, and it's perhaps a very good sign, but I found my, my time with the game a little too short. I would have liked much longer with the game, so yeah, a very good sign there as it was drawing me in. It seems to me then that KSP2 is certainly on the right track, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing more. Meanwhile, well, do check out the video on the screen right here, where you can witness my first flight up into orbit and back again in KSP2. Do check it out.